Today's vulnerable episode is with writer and activist Eve Rodsky. She's a best-selling author of Fair Play and Find Your Unicorn Space. She's also a Harvard-trained expert in organizational management, and she obviously runs workshops around these concepts about navigating domestic labor, um, invisible work, as she calls it. We unpack a lot of this today, and I gotta say, keep an open mind. It's, It's a really wonderful philosophy that I fully back, and Eve is a wonderful lady, and the books that she has written have helped many, many people. So keep an open mind, even if you're a guy, and if your wife sent you this, I'm really glad she did. Um, but yeah, let's all uh, let's all listen to today's vulnerable episode. I cannot tell you, Eve, how honestly excited and touched and just so happy to talk to you. I am. I I feel like my entire <laughs> journey with feminism has led me to this moment. I live in Texas. I have two daughters. Um, you know, I have this millennial um, side of me that was extremely invested in girl power. Um, I went to Barnard. Mm-hmm. I, like you said, I'm the voice of Kim Possible. I'm Belle. I'm like all of these icons. And I have these two daughters and I live here and everything's happening. So without delving too deep into that, what I want you to, what I just want to start with saying is thank you. I don't know if anyone could possibly thank you enough for what you've done, the conversation that you have started with your your concepts, the game, the card game, the philosophy behind it. What what people need to know is that fair play is is canon in the future it will be considered canon for feminists mm. <laughs> legitimately like there's lean in sure there's you know there's doubt there's all of these things but then there's fair play which you know really applies feminism in a useful way in a useful dialogue it's intersectional it's inclusive there's so many things about the book that struck me and let me tell you I didn't even fully apply it yet, which is really what I want to get into with you. And then, of course, everything else there is to unpack. But the principle alone gave me hope. Keeping the book, I've read it, obviously, but the but keeping the book near me, close to me. <laughs> yes. As like almost my Bible. <laughs> like, listen, the very mention of fair play keeps my husband listening actively (laughs) i've been able to get him (laughs) so thank you that's what i'm going to start off with that so um welcome to vulnerable (laughs) well first of all i got to list i went down a rabbit hole of listening to you and thank you for your vulnerability that is feminism Mm. um i think that we have really done women, as you know, a disservice um, because we are now in a place where we do two thirds or more of all the childcare and housework, even Mm -hmm. if we're, and and we do more, we do more if we bring home more money than our partners, assuming we're in a hetero cisgender relationship. We are in a place where we're doing twice the amount of housework um, and childcare as women did in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and so we don't, we, we, we've lost control of our time. And that's really what the fair play movement is about. And that's why, yes, hold it close to you. Even if you haven't implemented the system part yet, what mm-hmm. you're unlearning, the reason why it's resonating is because really fair play is a movement to cure time poverty for women. And to cure time poverty for women, we're not going to be doing what we did the past 10 years, which is gaslight them to think that they could just wake up an hour earlier and somehow be all refreshed for the day and um, squeeze every hour out of the day. You need self care, wake up. Self care, right? Just wake up at 2 a.m. Yeah. Yeah, wake up at 2 a.m., Christy. You can work out, do your mask. (laughs) But make sure you do your makeup. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, do your makeup. And you'll basically just die early from lack of sleep. Um, But anyway, so the point is 
that th- those messages have all collided. And I think now the pandemic, the one silver lining is that it's shown us that all these messages are basically garbage. And really the only thing that um, we need to fight for now is our time. Because, it, and we'll talk about and unpack that, but, but the more Please. women have time choice over how they use their day, the more that they have energy to fight these fights that we're going to have to fight over the next uh, 50 years. And the thing about the fight, too, and the time, women are very emotional um, beings, but they're also (laughs) extremely rational. And with everything we have to process from a day to day, on top of that, like you you call it emotional work, but also the physical labor, um, the emotional availability is physical in and of itself, in my opinion, with having to focus on your children's needs when they're both coming at you and you're out, you're, you're touched out and all that stuff. (laughs) But even just in generally, like generally speaking, there's a, there's, I can't, I can't even begin to talk about the workload without being triggered. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, that, that free time, if you want to call it, that is actually a time to process and formulate opinions. And like you said, like when you're robbed of that, you're robbed of the ability to form those opinions. And I see a lot of stay-at-home moms, I know some stay-at-home moms who are really erring on and clinging to their religious and conservative beliefs because it's convenient um, and it's easier and they don't have to form an opinion if they're super busy. And the dynamic is such that, you know, the man is making the money and as long as he respects me and doesn't cheat, I just have to fall in line and work my ass off and still exist in that time poverty, like lifestyle. But, you know, that doesn't make for a healthy marriage and it certainly doesn't make for a good skincare, like cream. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> puffy so, puffy please, bags. Do you want eye cream or do you want to end the, the, the patriarchal domination of women's time, you know? <laughs> I love that. Where do we start? Please tell me. Uh, you start, tell me. Like, do we start with you, please? Like, you icon, you woman, you goddess. I'm sorry, I have to. I love you. Um, well, where do you. we start? I, yes. Well, I think, look, <laughs> l- let's start with the fact that, Christy, you know, this is, I'll, I'll start with a couple stories to, to explain please. who I am. Uh, please. You know, this, I didn't set out I'll tell your listeners, right? I didn't set out to be an expert on the gender division of labor. You know, that wasn't what was on my third grade, what do you want to be when you grow up board? I think that board said astronaut, right, Christy? And so um, (laughs) I'm not like you who sort of had this beautiful, gorgeous voice and talent early. And so you were already on a path. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, but, But I did hear you know, through, through law school, um, when I, I got, th- I heard my whole life, you know, you will escape a single parent household. Um, this was the, the, the Gen X mentality, put your head down. Women are the same as men. Um, don't complain. Education will get you out. And so from a single parent household with a disabled brother, um, I found myself at, at, at Harvard law school um, which was a great place wow. for me because it was a place of advocacy and using your voice. And I remember being That's there. That's good. Um, and I was with, I remember being an Elizabeth Warren. She had like an orientation and they definitely didn't ask me what I wanted to be when, when I, I grew up then either. But I think if they mm-hmm. had, then I would have said I was 100% Christy going to be president, senator and Nick City dancer all at the same time. Like there was literally nothing stopping me. Nothing was stopping me at 21. I was going to issue my executive orders during the day, you know, at night and then get up to Uh legislate during the day. And then I was going to Mm -hmm. fly Air Force One in, you know, to perform on the iconic Madison Square Garden stage on Saturdays. And then I would just (laughs) change for state dinners on the way back. Like the reason why I tell you that is because I think so many of us, especially around 21 to 24, you know, we really do feel like we can conquer the world. And that's before the death, you know, by a thousand cuts of feminism, yep. ageism, um, you know, body criticism, all the things that uh, end up sort of harassment, 
um, you know, they, they there's start an awakening to, for sure, right, Eve? Yes. For, for feminism. Yes. I mean, I think I think I got it because I went to Barnard, and I was literally seeking it out. I was actually I didn't have that awakening until we watched a really serious documentary about these women and all this found footage of how they were being essayed in public. And I watched it, but I I came back to school to Barnard and studied women's leadership as a minor when I was 26. And I didn't even graduate. It took me like 12 years to graduate from Barnard. It was always a place mm-hmm. for me to fail upwards, like in, a, in my life, you know, because at at some colleges, especially in the Ivy Leagues, they allow you to leave for professional leave. And so I was bouncing back and forth. And um, when I finally I'm so proud of you, back, by the way. Like, yeah, that's amazing that you did this. <laughs> I mean, I don't think people realize how hard it's that a, is when you have, you know, d- school predicates itself on being distraction free. And so the ultimate distraction is working for pay. So um, you're pretty, yeah. that's pretty amazing that you graduated from Barnard. Oh, thank you. Well, I removed I removed myself from it a couple times and, and removed myself from the workforce to be able to dedicate it. But it was also a safety net for me. And Barnard was a community that was obviously a women's college. And so this essentially watching this documentary, being in this class gave me this awakening. But I had already experienced Me Too things. And like I was 26, you know what I'm saying? But for me, I had a very delayed millennial awakening that I had to seek out. And now I look at women now, and especially Gen Z, um, where it is at their front door and the awakening is happening just by being alive. So yeah, I'm, I'm imagining that that awakening for you as well upon being you know, at school for you was, was bound to happen sooner. <laughs> Later. Well, that's it. I mean, right. You cut to, you know, 13 years later, Christy. And, you know, I really thought I was going to be smashing all these glass ceilings. And really, the only thing I was really smashing was peas, you know, for my toddler, Zach, you know, while breastfeeding um, a baby, Ben. And I, I was not president um, or or senator um, or Nick City dancer, but I did actually really like my job. I was a lawyer using um, my sort of interesting skill sets around organizational management and family systems to work with um, families at a big company, um, all of their mm-hmm. philanthropy, helping them giving their money away. So it was a really cool job. But when I was that on that cool. maternity leave- Were you already leave, a mom? Yeah, I okay, was. Th- that was. That was Ben and Zach. Z- Zach was a toddler. Ben was mm-hmm. was a newborn. But what I remember so distinctly was the contrast between all of those dreams and sitting there isolated and alone with a second baby and a toddler um, and and thinking that my company was going to support me and then mm-hmm. n- learning on maternity leave that I had lost all my direct reports, mm-hmm. learning on maternity leave that um, all of my work was being sort of marked up and criticized. And I'm like, this makes no sense because, you know, I, I'm a great, I'm a good writer. That's one thing I am. Right. Um, and so right. I'm getting all these red lines back and I was like, what is happening here? Are they trying to get me to be demoralized and quit and to, to accept the fact that I don't deserve direct reports? Mm. And then the, the straw that okay. broke the camel's back was that um, there was no lactation space that I would be having to pump mm. in a broom closet. And that, mm-hmm. and that was... I think that awakening that my my job, that this place that I really enjoyed and thought they cared about me didn't mm-hmm. care about me, mm-hmm. happened around the same time that um, my marriage was was falling apart over mm-hmm. um, the lack of domestic help in the wow. home. Wow. And that's okay. what I talk about. That's important. You know? Yeah. That's that was very, it. That, very that's important. how I opened Fair Play. The, I'm surprised you didn't get Blueberry's text where my husband really had started to define me as his fulfiller of his smoothie needs. And and that was Your default. That was where we were. Your so default. I had no help at, at yeah. work. I had no help at home. Um, it right. was the most isolating time in my life. And you can mm-hmm. decide either to resign yourself and do it all and live like that. You could divorce right. and get, as my friend said, court ordered custody as a solution. But for me, I felt like there had to be another way. Yeah, court ordered custody doesn't seem like a great alternative to, <laughs> to child care. Like, decisions, I heard it all the right? time, Christy. I heard it all the time. 
If you, Ooh. I don't know what you're complaining about, Eve. If you want to change your circumstances, it just takes three words: court ordered custody. Jesus Christ. And then it's and yeah, I can't even. All right. So, you know, a lot of women you see and there's a couple there's a couple wrongs of influence that fair play has really blown in to um to the the social media space and I'm not sure you if you know or not, but um on TikTok there are many accounts dedicated to the principles of fair play. Um, I can send you them, uh, and please, I'm please do because I'm not a, I'm not a TikTok connoisseur. They quote so I never you. Really know they what's use there. okay. You should you should you should absolutely know the folks that are are are, are that adore you because maybe there's ways of I mean there's several yes there's yes, several and yes. it's also go, outside of talking about the fair play and the the domestic you know the domestic labor um, division and sharing. Um, they're talking about that isolating feeling that you're talking about a lot. It's called Moms of TikTok. It's a hashtag. And when you oh, just amazing. basically. Okay. I know Laura. Laura. I'm telling you. But other than that, and mm-hmm. Casey Davis, but shout out to both of you. Thank you. I got um, such your amazing women. Thank you for being fair play uh, cultural warriors. But yes, I'm going to. I will for search real. the Moms of TikTok hashtag. Yes. Yeah, of course. Of course. I will hook it up. If you need a social Thank media you. feminist Thank manager, you. I will Thank help. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that your message is is being sung to a lot of women and getting into their minds and hearts because they need that and they're isolated. And what TikTok is allowing them to do is find each other and talk to each other. And their comment section is filled with support every single time. I always try to be uh, that person as well. But we we come together in a lot of ways. We grieve together. You know, that's why I think TikTok is being called into question in some ways is because it's serving as a as a way to aggregate like minds and people. Mm-hmm. Hey, on any end of whatever world they are, people are coming together and they are using this app. But with moms of TikTok, they're using it as a support system. Um, they don't have the village that they used to have. I, I guess there's that whole topic of, you know what I mean? Where, well, 100%. if we have a village, so-and-so can raise so-and-so and you can go to, I I don't really understand. How, it's very broad, <laughs> that whole concept of the village. I know. Well, and you never had a village either. It so doesn't exist in did America. Did it ever? It just doesn't. No. Did it, no. Wait, no, I mean, not here. No, we're not a country of a village, Christy. We are an individual. <laughs> we're a country that um, di- lives and dies on individualism. So you're right. That village never existed here. Never. All right. Well, then moving on, because that that's that about some. I think we always, especially as Americans, like we hold on to this ideal. And I think more and more we're all realizing that that never really existed. <laughs> No, and I think there's a real problem because the ideal of this village, right? Um, we're actually it's the opposite. We're we're ashamed for a village. Um, I remember ten years ago, and then when I started to interview people for we have a documentary coming out, which is so exciting. Yes. Um, yes. This week, and what's so I won't say I'll say that again just in case you don't want to date this. Um, we have a documentary. No, I don't care. Out. We'll date it. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So we have a, a documentary coming out July 8th. And what's so great about it is we were able to follow, we interviewed 100, actually 105 couples during the pandemic. We, we um, Jennifer wow. Newsom, our director, narrowed it down. But what you see is you see different family structures. And the one thing, Christy, that I think you'll see the most, um, because COVID especially took it away, is um, mm-hmm. we see people at their most raw because they're literally the illusion of the village is, is, is dead. Um, mm-hmm. because even if you had ancillary help and grandparents, um, they were gone. And so oh, Jesus, we all now know right. what it feels like to, to live without a village. And I think mm-hmm. we, we know how isolating and dark that can be. So again, hopefully we will resurrect this concept of what I like to call care feminism. Um, because care feminism does connote that we, it's a mutual aid idea, which is, you know, self-help is I help myself. It's back to that individualism. But really, Fair Play as a book is rooted in mutual aid, which is that mm-hmm. you get other people to come in as partners to hold cards for you. Um, and, and it can be your partner. It can be if you're a single mother, your kids. It could be your extended community. But the predication, sorry, the 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 assumption in Fair Play is that 
you will not hold all the cards, which is the metaphor. There's a hundred cards. They represent all childcare, domestic work. You do not hold all of them regardless of what your family structure is. If you're a single parent, you do not, you, you, you can't hold all of them. The state has to help you. Correct. We have to fight for you. Okay. Um, if you are in a relationship and you're a stay at home mom, still, it's not going to be 50, 50, but you are not obliged to hold all of the cards. This is more than a full-time job and we have to get a village in place to share the unpaid labor of society. That's, that's the key. Right. And then there's also cards for unicorn space, right? Yes. Yes. Which we should talk about because that's another book that you have. My as favorite well. card ever yeah. um, comes yeah. from this idea that there is, we think of laundry. I think when I ask people about domestic work, the first things they think of are dishes and laundry. But as you mm-hmm. will start to see about, um, about life and humanity is that our memories, the things that we uh, the emotional labor, Christy, you were talking about before. That's in cards. Uh, I'm just looking at some like gestures of love. You know, who's bringing the flowers to the recital? That's a card. Um, like cards, like uh, mental health for kids. You mm-hmm. know, these are not laundry and housework. These are things that take a lot of stressful, um, emotional, and cognitive. What I call cognitive labor. Um, sure, mm-hmm. you can make kids lunches. That's what we're thinking about. But what you were saying is, you know, things like um, the tooth fairy. And my favorite mm-hmm. card of all um, is unicorn space, which is we forget mm-hmm. about that card. We, we, we say to ourselves, we are parents, we are partners, we're professionals. By professionals, I mean anybody who works for pay or who works unpaid in the home. And mm-hmm. that's it, Christy. We do Mm -hmm. it on repeat, but where Mm -hmm. is our humanity? Where is the time for Christy outside of Mm -hmm. her, her paid work? Where is our time for Christy outside of her role as a mother? Where is Christy? Where is her creativity? That's just done for creativity's sake and not for money. Mm -hmm. Where is Mm -hmm. Christy and that space that you deserve because you are in a creative profession so it's going to be even harder for you to claim more space because a lot of what you do for, and I will say this podcast is a unicorn space. I mean, whether or not it's for pay, you vulnerable get is. to be yeah. here. Yes. Vulnerable I think is. to me, vulnerable feels like a unicorn space because what it is, it's a space Thank where you. you get curiosity, connection, and completion. <laughs> but that's how I feel about Absolutely. it. When I was listening to it this that's week, great. it's so, so that's it. So I would say continue this podcast regardless of whether it's for pay or not, you get a billion dollars for it or nothing. It is important. It's that type of space that you are inspiring curiosity, connection, and completion. Women need it. And we deserve a permission to be unavailable. So I will say if any card you hold, if you're not going to adopt the fair play system, that's fine. If you just listen and take away one thing from today, it's that the antidote to burnout for your listeners, unfortunately, is not going to be a walk around the block or a drink with a friend, even though those are important. Or the bath. antidote to burnout yeah. is being consistently interested in your own life. And that's what we're going to give people today. So w- you grew up in a single parent household. Was it, may I ask, was it your father or your mother? My mother, my mother, a single mother, yes. Okay. So, so you a single mother, and then when you went into your marriage and you had your your children, and then your 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 law firm failed you, um, did you have sort of an awakening of yourself? Obviously, you did, which brought you to the book. But what did you take from your upbringing into that relationship to 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 sort of that that awakening that you had, where you were like, this isn't going to cut it, and this is the death of what we have here. This dynamic is toxic. I mean, you, did you, I'm just trying to like project that like if you yeah. saw your mom do it on her own and then you sort of then were tasked with like, I got to think like that was probably, there was a lot of guilt in so far that you had a partner to do this with at first because so much of you is like, well, I should be grateful. I should be grateful. Like for example, in my case, I have a nanny. And she currently lives with us. You know, she has a contract and and we're very blessed to have that. But we also work 
a l- very, very hard in order to afford that many for it to make sense for us. And it becomes a part of the system for me and my husband to work as producing partners, et cetera, et cetera. So I always am constantly feeling sh- like shame and I should be grateful and I should do more than I can physically do it, you know? So how do yes, you, how do you rectify? Yes. Yeah. I think there's a lot to unpack there. First, yes. Um, well, f- let's just get out this this idea that's, you know, th- I think the first thing I'll say, and then I want to go back to exactly how our, our upbringing does and how all of our upbringings will condition us to exactly just feel grateful um, mm-hmm. to have a husband that you see once in a while. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, that's more than that person, right? That, that's sort of where we are at this point. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. but I think one thing I want to point out is the beauty and power of domestic workers. And for so long, women have, 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 have talked about getting up earlier or, or hid the fact that we have help back to this idea that we're not allowed to have a village. Now, the problem has been though, not only just hiding the fact that we have help, but, but, um, the fact that that has been the only solution. So during the lean in feminism years, um, Mm -hmm. and I know that because in 2011 is when I start to interview for this book, it's been a really long journey of now 11 years, um, and thousands and thousands of, of in 17 And that's why it's canon, man. Well, thank you. That's why it's canon because, because these last 11 years have been insane. It has been 11 years (laughs) and we went from lean in era to where we are now, but I will say never trust a self-help book or a mutual aid book, as I was calling it without a bibliography. Um, it's mm-hmm. very important. You, you look go. to the back first and make sure there's a bibliography in any book you're reading. You want to make sure it's well-researched. It's not just the person's, um, espousings. If you care mm-hmm. about, and you even have um, a glossary, damn it, yes, a glossary, a glossary. <laughs> but I think really the point about domestic labor that I think is really important as you move to care feminism is that women heard a message. If you're so overwhelmed, just get help. Correct. That is what men say. I will give you as much help as you need. If you're so overwhelmed, get help. The problem with yep. take, is that it takes men out of the equation. And what it's doing is it's saying, I'm going to build my career on the backs of the undervalued labor of black and brown women. So yep. that is not okay. What we have to right. say instead is we have help. Domestic laborers, domestic workers are valuable. They are part of our family and our system. Right. But that is not uh-huh. enough to handle the emotional labor. If you are married to a man, what you'll see in the fair play system is there's 100 cards. 50 of those cards are not outsourceable. As much as you love Alexia, she's not deciding whether your child's adenoids are being taken out. She's Absolutely. not going to be your tooth fairy. She is not Absolutely. the one who's showing up at Olympics Day. I mean, sure, sometimes. But the point right. is we've had such a non-nuanced conversation about um, domestic work as if it's A, invisible, and B, right. the, 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 the only solution. And the truth is it's a both and. We need help. Um, we mm-hmm. should pay for it. We we need um, right. subsidies to do that. We can't do it all alone. Absolutely. We need our government to help us. And on top of that, That'd be great. <laughs> you know, we <laughs> <would be> great. <laughs> child care is very expensive as we know, and we cannot keep it that way. So anyway, that's sorry for that rant, but I do think that no, it no, it's actually really get it's not where a rant we, are, we need to I, be. Absolutely, because these conversations need to be had. And what I love about the documentary, even just watching the trailer, it invites men into the conversation. It, it, there was something that was said in the trailer about how this is the opposite of what what feminism is to women. This is to men. Yes. Can you unpack yes, that for me? Men. Well, yes. So this gets back to what you were saying about about what happens to women, because you were asking about my childhood. So when as a kid, I saw one woman do it all, right? And and she did it right. poorly. <laughs> I love you, mom, but it wasn't, it was not easy. She did her best. Right? And <laughs> yes, she did right. her best. And so instead of understanding, well, my father should have, you know, actually done his part um, or not, you know, ghosted us, um, mm-hmm. it, it, it became me blaming her and to picking up her slack. So Mm-hmm. I was her chief bill officer, um, her chief financial officer at starting at seven. Um, I, I called Stuyvesant Town um, 
and had them know that my mother's check was coming because I didn't want the eviction notices to come under the door. I sort of became, I I started, I remember, I distinctly remember the first eviction notice. Um, So I must, maybe it was was second grade. So, because I remember Miss, I was in Miss. Holy shit. Ben DeHaan's and you, class. And you PS40. understood the implications at, at, in second grade. Oh, you understood the implications 100%. of being evicted from your home. Okay. A hundred percent. Not even, not even a question. And that's the okay. thing. If you watch um that new show, or not new show, that 90s show on Netflix, it's called like, am I old enough or something? It's like two-year-olds uh-huh. shopping for groceries. Like we yes, know yes. As, our, our kids need to be involved in, <laughs> our kids need to be involved in fair play early. And that means okay. understanding the value of these cards, the metaphor, you know, not just doing the, the chores and the housework, but really understanding the humanity and what we do for them. But yes. it, because we understand it and we can do it okay. and they can be involved. But being part of that single, fa- fa- being part of that single parent dynamic mm-hmm. where I didn't see men doing childcare and housework, I had no role model for it, Christy, right? So, sure, sure. It made me feel like women can do it all and have it all and be it all. That horrible lie, which ultimately um, was dismantled for me in mm-hmm. this Blueberries breakdown, you know, we're seeing seeing myself in a relationship that I I vowed, I vowed from an early age I would have equal partner, Christy, because I saw how hard it was for yeah. my mother. And I, I yeah. did have that equal partner. We were killing it in life. You know, he was making Mm. dinner. I was doing laundry. Everything was so fair until our kids came along where we then started to revert back to horrific assumptions and instead of, you know, decision making. And that was, that was how. So what the hell, what the hell is that, Eve? Like, why, why is that so common that, you know, women who are, you know, smart and they know what they're doing and, you know, even the men are a part of that and they're like cohabitating and 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 then it's like we have the kids and then it's just like you said reverting and then i even have these conversations where i have to out i have to teach that out of my husband i have to be like but and i by the way am privileged because we are producing partners which means that he is representing me in my interests and directly benefits from me succeeding do you see what i'm saying so he has to forego any notion of my value and undervaluing me. His job, a part of his job, he has other investments and other things he's doing, but uh, the, the time that he chooses to work with me, right, he has to overvalue me. His entire identification with me as a person in the conversation. So I'm extremely privileged in this, you know, this dynamic. And even still, there's the reverting at times where he's like, well, you know, we're in the, we're, <laughs> we're in the grocery store. And he's like, well, you push the cart because you're the woman. And I'm like, God damn it. You yes, take this cart. You tell me what you want. And it's heavy. And I don't feel like pushing. <laughs> I get it's, it. And by the way, that's wide. a great metaphor. That is a great metaphor. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and we, we know that just because, you know, again, you work together and, um, or you, you're an equal breadwinner. It does not, change our dynamics, uh, around, around who does gender the majority really. of, yeah. So, so what we realize now, I think, and what was, it was sort of my Kaiser Soze moment, Christy, where, um, you know, I don't know if you remember usual suspects, but you see like sort of the wall and you're like, Oh my God, all those pieces come together. We know who, who he is. Yes. Um, it, yes. It, it, yes. it was That's amazing for me. It was the moment where I realized that the home is so dangerous because we think we're fighting over off season blueberries, as I was saying before, or who's who left the sponge in the sink or whose turn it is to wake up with a crying baby. Oh, so much more. Mm-hmm. But but mm-hmm. the presenting problem is not the real problem. And the real problem is that um men men don't don't value women's time the same as their own. And I'm not saying that to individual men. There are great individual men, but as a society we've taught women to view their time as if it's sand, as if it's infinite. And we've told women to guard men's time. We do live past, we do outlive most of them. We we do, we do. Um, (laughs) And we now know that women who are in unhappy marriages actually live less long than than women who are Mm. are single. So uh, just FYI. Um, but, But men's time is diamonds. 
It's finite. Women's time is infinite. It's sand. And the problem is it, it, we're conditioned from birth. So that's why you're asking why it's still happening even if we if if Seth and I came in believing it was not going to happen that way as domestic work it's harder because it becomes a lot it becomes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a week more with kids what happens mm-hmm. is we start to guard men's time oh my god you know he needs to rest um mm-hmm. i i'm better at at doing multiple things, he's better at focusing on one task at a time. I'm centering the heteronormative here because that's where the problems come. And so the hardest part is since birth, since birth, we've been told um, our time is worthless. We hear things like breastfeeding is free. Um, When it's 1800 hours a year, it's a full-time job. We, We see women entering male professions and salaries automatically coming down. So we, we're told time is worthless or, or, or worth less for women. Yeah. And then, Christy, yeah. this is what happens. What happened to me, you're asking why it changed? Because I internalized the four messages, what I call toxic time messages, that I'm asking women to throw and burn. And those four were, I said to myself, my husband makes more money than me, so I should do more domestic work. My job is more flexible, mm-hmm. so I should do more domestic work. In the time it takes me to tell him, her, they, what to do, I should do it myself. Um, and then the fourth, which was the hardest, was I'm a better multitasker. I am wired differently to see that we're out of diapers, that um, mm-hmm. you know we're we're low on formula, and and mm-hmm. that those are all wrong. They are not true. And if you've ever said one of those things to yourself, you're not alone. But what I'm here to tell you is that there's no gender difference. In, in how we multitask, um, there is, it is absolutely wrong to say in the time it takes me to tell him, her, they, what to do, I should do it myself because that devalues all your future time. That's a simple economics, present value argument. What we have to do is recognize that time is 24 hours in a day. And regardless, regardless of your family structure, you as a woman deserves to treat her time as diamonds You deserve a permission to be unavailable from your roles. Availability is not part of your identity. And the only way to do that is not just through hiring help, as we just said, it's to invite men into into unpaid labor. That is the only way that we are going to move forward as feminists. And, And it is something that's come to me now after 10 years. I can't, if you care about what's happening with abortion, if you care about what's happening with guns, what we have to do is get women time back before we can ask them to save our democracy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and then I think con- conversely too with, with men, um, there's always going to be, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a, a political thing, but like them leaning into th- that work that might need to be done, that support, do you feel like they're also hiding behind that concept of, well, I can't, go, you know, protest or I can't allocate money in our budget to donate to, you know, this or that fund uh, because, you know, I have to save the money for, you know, I have to make the money or, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it could happen that men reuse tropes. They hide behind that toxic masculinity. Um, It's extremely convenient. They have to, of course. But also, um, you know, if, if they don't understand the benefits you know, or they haven't been been seen. If they, they they they're not when you treat someone's time like diamonds, you hide the hard things, right? Things like sandwiches just appear. Like we now know, like Thoreau, Emerson, all these people who wrote, you know, on Golden Pond. I mean, not um, not Golden Pond, um, Walden Pond, wherever the hell. You know, I don't read um, sort of white men from the nineteen eighteen hundreds, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, except for Shakespeare, um, I stick to gotcha. women authors now. But we might have been but, a woman, you know. The, the, but they, they all, they all were now learning. Like the, the reason they were able to sort of sit on the lake and and muse was because um, their mothers, their wives, were bringing them sandwiches, were protecting their time. Um, we Making see it in sure Albert Einstein's biography. Exactly, uh-huh. Einstein's um, first wife was a very. Um, you know, very high potential physicist who ended up with two kids and lost her career. Um, you right. know, I even saw it when I went to 
my toddler transition program, Christy, because you go back to village and I remember thinking, okay, this village is going to save me because at that time I didn't think that my partner could because I was still protecting Seth's time. I never thought right. he could be somebody who would come to the toddler transition day because it was during the work day. Like, God forbid I asked him. So of course it was, I remember this, mm-hmm. it was about 10 years ago now, as I was saying with, um, the same time I was losing my, my, my direct reports and my job was, was telling me I had to pump in a Imploding. broom closet. I'm everyone's Imploding, saying, yeah. well, you just need a village, get to your preschool. You're going to find the people that you love. Yeah. And I remember sitting there with those people and the preschool teacher saying, look around. These are the people who are going to help you in a pinch They're You're going to be at their kids' weddings and their bar mitzvahs. You're going to, um, they're going to be there to support you. And I remember thinking, okay, this is my village. I finally arrived, Christy. I have a preschool mm-hmm. and these are the parents I'm going to be with for a long time. And this preschool yeah. teacher is saying, you know, these are the people that are going to know you better than anyone's ever known you. And then I looked down at my name tag and it says Zach's mom. Oh no. Zachar- Zachary oh. Rodsky mother. Oh, and so Christy, I remember thinking, okay, these are the people that are going to know me better than anyone's ever known me. They don't even know my fucking name. Oh my God. And that's wow. when I realized we're doomed. We are, we are doomed in overwhelm plus erasure. That's where mm-hmm. we are as, as women right now. We are being mm-hmm. overwhelmed and erased at the same time. And that's when I realized that this is no longer sustainable. Um, we're going to move forward and we're going to move forward in a productive way that um, becomes a love letter to men that invites them into this work with us because if they're in this work with us, we will finally value it. Do why don't <laughs> my man, my, my husband is extremely, I would say extremely masculine. So my husband, um, his mom had him at 17, um, ended up finding <clears throat> a nonviolent, um, stepfather. Um, but was, they raised him very strict. He rebelled, went into the Marines, had a calling after September 11th. Very, very masculine guy, I guess you'd say, but not necessarily toxic. He does have things he's out learning, but he's willing to have conversations. We're going to do, you know, the game together and it's going to help. I love him, by the way. And just so you know, military, military (laughs) men are my favorite fair players because they understand the power of systems. Absolutely. Yes, they do. That's right. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not going to say that every Marine is <laughs> willing to have right. these conversations because they call them crayon eaters sometimes. And sometimes, you know, they can be very toxic. But uh, when I met him, I think he was, you know, educating himself. And 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 he knew that he was <laughs> meeting a girl that had had her own career and, and that enticed him because I was an artist. And there were I, I was an interesting person, right? And what, what pisses me off the most about certain men is that, you know, they want you and then you do exactly what they want you to do in the home and then they don't want you anymore because you just can't Correct. be everything. Correct. It is so, it's what, and that's why, you know, they say, oh, feminists are angry because they can't get a man. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, that's so, I can't wrap my head around that without feeling But that's eventual, called the, per- but- I call that in fair play, the permission paradox. Because there was all these men who said to me, I just want to retire my wife. I just want her not to feel like she has pressure and, and I can be the provider. And then these women listened and they, right. they give up their paid work, their identity. They're like, yeah, this they beca- sounds good. Yeah. It sounds good. <laughs> they put on their kids' initials on their necks, the mom, like I did. And then one day uh-huh. you end up a gray version of yourself sitting in a, a circle of preschool, you know, bouncing mm-hmm. your kid, playing patty cake on your lap and being like, how the fuck did I get here? And so mm-hmm. the truth, the permission paradox is don't listen to anybody. Um, you have to understand the life-changing magic, not just of organizing your junk drawer, but of long-term thinking. And when you decide and choose that um, your unicorn space is going to be the perfection of your children or just raising your children, and that's what your partner wants for you. Um, you, st- it's it's fine to make that life choice as long as you understand that you still need that unicorn space. You still deserve not to to drown in all of these cards, the, all of the unpaid labor, because then 
everything you thought or your partner thought this was going to be, this perfect leave it to beaver family, it doesn't work, Christy. I wish I could tell you it no. works. But somebody no, ends that. up saying this agreement um, is for the birds. Yeah, 100%. And so I actually just thought of something. Those of you listening or watching, um, if if you know somebody who's thinking about, you know, they're married or whatever, maybe they're not married, but they're thinking of being with their partner and having children and raising a family, I think fair play would be really great to read prior to having children, yes, don't you? Yes, yes. It's because really... some of these conversations can be, they can be started before the issues started. even happen. Started. And that's really the secret formula. If we're getting to the secret formula here of... Where do we end up? What's the rainbow? We're going dark to go light. The rainbow here, um, and again, I, I really do encourage you, Christy, with your partner, watch the Fair Play documentary. It's it's on okay. everywhere, you know, iTunes, Amazon Prime. It's just a beautiful uh, rainbow of seeing all of these men understand that that they that this benefits them. And I'll just, I'll end with like a, a quick story because it's really, okay. like I said, the secret formula here is boundaries, systems, and communication. That's it. The boundaries is we, we've done, we said it's all time is created equal. Believing your time is diamonds. The system is the ownership mindset of fair play. You can dive into that in the book. It's, it's, that's the easy part. The self-explanatory part is when you own a task, you do it from start to finish. And then communication is actually the hard part because people are afraid to have these conversations, Christy, especially yes. if you are, you know, like maybe your husband or I am where we grew up in, you know, bootstrap ourselves, don't need right. anybody. Um, You're still white so, knuckling it. You know what that white looks like. You know how that feels. That's it. So yep. what are we going to stop and tell you what I need? Like, that's just not... Mm -hmm. In our, it feels too you know, familiar. DNA, yeah. exactly, right? Mm -hmm. Or or we're worried we'll be rejected if we ask. And so there's so right. much hurdles. So the boundaries, the systems of communication. The boundaries is hard. It's unlearning. It's what we did today. And so this is a 101. I want to tell people, stick with us because, you know, Christy and I will come back. You know, we could do a 201. We could oh be God, here for that. you in this journey. Um, we can bring some listeners to actually unpack how they're doing it, but boundaries, systems, absolutely communication. And the story I want to end on, I think brings all three together. It's a very small story, Christy, but it's sort of, go for it. It's I'll call them Richard and Amy. So Richard is sort of like, you know, the old school, um, guy we're talking about now, right? He's sort of been conditioned mm -hmm. under the toxic masculinity box or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. Amy is his wife who did hear, you know, I'll re retire you. And, and they had that type of dynamic, but they decided in the pandemic that it wasn't working for them. They were going to play fair play. Um, big part of the system is going through all the cards, deciding what to take out like holiday cards. No one should ever do a holiday card. Um, and what to keep in and tell stories about why it's important. The why is what we're missing in communication. So they tell stories to each other about the magical beings card. And that is the card we referenced earlier. That's the Tooth Fairy, Lucky Leprechaun, Santa. They both had that in their lives. They felt like it was really important to mm -hmm. continue that magic. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the game, uh, Richard decides to be the Tooth Fairy. He says, I'm going to take it now for um, our kids. So he does. He, they agree that that's one of his cards. Uh, Amy says, okay, I will allow you to hold that card. I'm stepping off. Um, and the first time that he's the tooth fairy, um, the tooth fairy doesn't come. So the tooth fairy doesn't come and his daughter, their daughter wakes up and she's all excited and you know, she's upset. And so what they report back to me is what their dynamic would be like before fair play. So before fair play, they said to me, what it would have happened was Amy would have said, this is why I don't involve you in domestic work or anything with our kids. I can't rely on you for anything. She would have gone always and or always and never. You never help. You're never good enough with her communication style. Um, and Richard told me that he would have blamed Amy for, 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 for not reminding him to put the dollar under the pillow. That was their gotcha. dynamic. Right. Post fair play, she 
decides to communicate the way we ask in fair play, which is high cognition, low, low emotion. So she waits for it. Mm -hmm. She tells Mm -hmm. him that night, I I mean, that day, you know, obviously that was super disappointing, but you know, I'm going to let you carry through your mistake. He owns it. Ah, so she doesn't, so she, but did she actually pay the money after he, like, did no. she rectify that no. for the child? No. Or the consequence just, stood? That's it. She just says, she said yeah. that morning to her child, yeah, I don't know hard. what happened to the tooth fairy. And she brought, she talked to her husband when her, her daughter went to school and said, yeah. I will let you carry through this mistake. She did not fix it. Good. So what he does is, this is the best part of the story. He has room now to carry through his mistake. He understood that he owned it because they had discussed it in yeah. advance. So he emails right. toothfairy at gmail.com um, and says, after his daughter gets home from school and says, you know, what the heck, Tooth Fairy? You know, where, what happened to you? He gets a response, which is the craziest thing of all time. Thank you out there, toothfairy at gmail.com for saving so many families. And the response said something like, you know, due to supply chain issues, you know, t- teeth are... I'm backlogged on teeth or whatever she said. (laughs) He prints out the email. He reads it to his daughter and he says, you know, when the tooth fairy comes late because she's backlogged, she brings double the money. And so that's what happened. He, the tooth fairy came that night with double the money. And it cost him money too. (laughs) It cost him, it cost him. But, and now his daughter asks, you know, is the tooth fairy coming on time or is she coming late? Cause she sort of wants the extra money. So it's called the accountability interest, accountability interest, (laughs) but it, it, it really does show me that there's another way forward in small interactions. But did he report, did Richard report back? What what was the change? What incentivized him? Granted, like I do this with my toddler, um, you know, you have to let them feel their feelings, let them go through that. And also natural consequences is basically the same principle, right? And I have a very hard time with that, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I want to fix it and I love it. people carry through their and, mistake. Carry and I'm through trying, your mistake. I'm, I'm getting better at it, honestly. It's a day-by-day thing. Just like all of this is a day-by-day thing. And I do think, you know, when people <clears throat> see, oh, Christy's talking with Eve today, some angry feminist shit's going to be talking about. It's like, yes, first yes, of all, no one's no. angry. No one's raising their voice. No one's we're laughing. You know, violating we're laughing. human rights yes. over here. We're laughing. We're, we're talking, more importantly, and we're problem solving. And then there's a system that already exists. And we're talking about applying that s- a system because so many times people want to be like, well, you know, your system. I'm sure that you've got criticisms on your book like lean in got a, a, a lot of criticism and i'm i'm curious i mean how do you dispel criticisms when they're like well the, you know this is a book that's written by you and and like this doesn't apply do you feel as though you've you've kind of covered that in the book in the documentary um yeah sort of- i mean look okay. i would say you know the 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 main um the main criticism of the book is people say well where is the card for paid work so it's a lot of um men saying to me, well, there's a hundred cards here of unpaid labor, but where's your card for paid labor? And what I say is, yes. And what I say Mm -hmm. is, look, look, that is why this is not 50-50. That is why this is not a system of 50-50. This is a system of ownership. Regardless of whether you work for pay, yes, it may not, you may not hold 50 cards of the hundred if you're a person who is the one who's the primary breadwinner whether it's, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever gender. However, that is exactly what I address in the book, which Mm -hmm. is that Mm -hmm. this accounts for flexibility. Even if you Mm -hmm. hold one card, like the Tooth Fairy card, what I saw in that relationship, they they will never go back. Richard will never go back. And what he does say to me is that the experience of failing, because that was what he was so worried about, Christy, why fair play is a love letter to men is because they didn't ever say to me, I hate my family. I don't want to help. Right. It was when I help, I do everything wrong and wow. I don't know my role. Mm. And so that was the number one answer for men when, when I asked them why they don't do more. And so, and you Richard don't, and you so don't afraid think that to that, fail Amy. Yeah. I see. And he did, he did fail her yeah, and right. his child in that tooth fairy example. But so he was men don't able understand to carry through his mistake. That's what it so was. The space. Men, 
the the space, right, exactly, of learning and processing. That space that we were talking about earlier, too, about how women need that space to process. And we exactly. don't give the gift exactly. of the space to the men. I got it. It's a, it's a human thing. It's not a it's not a male yes. female thing. It's it's everybody getting that space to process stuff and we kind of take that away from them. That's really great. But last point too and I'm just curious and this is me just selfishly asking. The other yeah. thing that I see a lot online from similar people who, you know, love fair play and talk a lot about those principles is this 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 concept of weaponized incompetence. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and how many times would you say in the relationships that you investigated and over the last 11 years how many men are actually malicious with their time and if if it is a combination what exactly is that <laughs> weaponized okay. incompetence is a really interesting um concept because what i found is that this goes back to the assumptions versus structured decision-making. When mm -hmm. men sit down to agree to hold cards, I do not see them trying to mess them up so that they won't have to hold them again. Um, gotcha. I, what I see is weaponized incompetence has more to do in my mind, Christy, with what was happening in my home. I tell a story in the documentary about a drunk man's jacket. I tell it in the book too. That was sitting on my lawn when I went away for a work work trip. Seth texted me. There's a broken bottle, beer bottle and jacket on our lawn. We had a toddler. I put it out of my head, work 15 days in Seattle, come home. The jacket and beer bottle are still there on the lawn. And Christy, as I like to say, you know, I gave Seth at first the benefit of the doubt because you know, I figured maybe he was dead. But when I found out he wasn't dead, um, he was happily alive um, and told me he had four hours after his long day to decompress and watch Sports Center and work out, but not enough time, you know, to pick up a jacket and beer bottle he found on our lawn 16 hours earlier. You could call that weaponized incompetence. But what Seth now says that he says in the documentary so beautifully is that he genuinely, genuinely believed it was someone else's job to pick up that jacket and beer wow. bottle. Okay. And, and that We've got is, our work cut out for us. <laughs> that's it, <laughs> right? That's the unlearning. Yeah. It took us they a need long help. time to get there. They need help. It wasn't I'm his job. This. Because his time is diamonds, someone else has always been around him to pick up that slack. That's the metaphor here. We, we yeah. As a society, we've been picking up drunk guys' jackets and beer bottles around men since the beginning of the industrial revolution. And um, let me tell you, Eve, been, diamonds are stop. literally made of sand. Yes, yes, they're made of sand. Oh my God. I there never could be that, no refined oh diamond yes, unless it yes, was yes. from pressurized sand. So on that note, Eve, I want to yeah. thank you so much for your time, your energy, your thoughts, you. Um, and um, I, I absolutely- Let's do a practical 2.0. Let's do one- where we I would can freak bring out. in some of your I would listeners love that. and we yes. can answer their questions like NPR style. Are you hearing this? Um, Vulnerable how the people. System goes. Okay. Yes. Let's do, yeah. let's do a and practical it can be, one. And it can be people who have different versions, right? Of domestic um, applications. And, and that way exactly. we can. Exactly. We, we want LGBTQIA really couples. We want roommates. Let's we talk want about it. Um, women yeah, who are the breadwinners. Cool. Any, any single, and any, yeah. we, we've done every family structure. We've addressed every family structure in Fair Play, so we'd love to hear your stories. Oh, I'm excited. I may have to snag my my husband, too, if he'll do it. He's, yes, he can yes, do it. please. He, he can do it. I would love right, to have right. him. Come on. Well, really excited about Fair Play's documentary. I'm going to watch it. It's it's going to be out, right, this this week? Yes, this, um, this week, July 8th. Yes. Great, great. So please go go watch that. And if you haven't, if you haven't added Fair Play to your library, do so now. And a unicorn space I'm going to also pick up. So buy all the things that have Eve's name on it right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Christy. And keep, thank you. Keep, keep your vulnerable listeners um, close because, like I said, I this will. unicorn space of curiosity, connection with others, and completion, meaning that even if an episode isn't perfect, you put it out into the world. That's that's the model hmm. that, that you're modeling for other, other women. Okay. 
Um, so thank you. Thank you for your, for your vulnerability. My, one of my favorite words. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Mm-hmm.